Um, thank you very much, Andrew. I, I thought I'd won, actually, because I'm here. <laughs> but uh, that's the vagaries of politics, which I'll um, expand on a little bit. But can I say thank you at the outset to Professor Tom Frame for the kind invitation to address this important conference and indeed uh, commend the organisers for sponsoring it. This conference is the first to examine Australia's recent experience with train, advise, assist missions and explores the ADF's future role in enhancing security amongst partner nations with presentations from a large number of government agencies. The agenda is therefore broad, ranging from our overseas engagements to building domestic support for these missions. It is in this context that I was asked to address the issue of the political cycle and long-term commitments. Now, can I say at the outset that what I offer is a personal perspective, having served in the defence portfolio for a relatively short period of time, albeit at a time of considerable activity, reform and indeed forward thinking. May I acknowledge the many people who informed my thinking while adding the usual caveat that these reflections are mine alone. Nor should anything I say be interpreted as a reflection on any person. Ladies and gentlemen, the first responsibility of a national government is the safety and security of its citizens. This is its ongoing primary responsibility. It involves years and decades long considerations and commitments that run beyond the short term political and electoral cycles. Our involvement in Afghanistan, for example, which is now some 15 years in length and our longest ever military engagement is an example. A series of long-term challenges face us today. The spread of Islamist terrorism throughout our region, the rise of an increasingly assertive China and the interplay of the great powers China, Russia and the United States, and the risk of a failed nation state in our region with all the threats to peace and stability that that might entail. That is why we planned the recent Defence White Paper for the next two decades. It recognised the growing importance of the Indo-Pacific as the major trading region of the world and the concomitant need for freedom of transit on the waters and in the skies. Central to the primary responsibility to defend the nation, and that's for all governments regardless of their political persuasion, is a compact with defence. The intention is to establish a long-term basis for action that is less susceptible to short-term political and economic disturbances. This compact is the proper alignment between the government's strategic aspiration on behalf of the citizens of the nation with the task that the government asks defence to undertake. And completing this trinity of the compact is the resources which defence requires to develop the capabilities to perform the tasks and all three, I believe, need to be in alignment. This compact has not always been upheld with aspirations not matched by resources. The compact, which differs from that which formerly operates under a similar name in the UK, lies at the heart of the most recent Defence White Paper. It was also central to the first principles review and the competitive evaluation processes, which I initiated and will discuss shortly. Just as defence should be able to rely upon the government of the day for the provision of resources to meet the national security aspirations, tasks and projects, the government on behalf of the citizens should expect that defence will operate in an efficient, timely and businesslike manner. The commitment to return defence expenditure to, to over 2 per cent of GDP and the 20-year outlook in the White Paper, including the 10-year costed acquisition plan, reflected our subscription to that compact. Having established a compact, it is critical that all future governments, regardless of their political hue, adhere to it. The quid pro quo of this response by the government is the efficiency and performance of defence, which brings me to the first principles review. In the report of the review, Creating One Defence, the team stated, and I quote, in seeking to determine what has prevented defence from changing, we noted three root causes which over the past decade have created complacency and inertia. First, the high operational tempo and increasing national security demands over the past decade have demanded high levels of the senior leadership's time and attention. Secondly, budget uncertainty with $18.2 billion removed from the defence budget from 2009-10 onwards, which has led to reactive planning 
third military capability and a hollowing out of enablers such as a state and information and communications technology. And thirdly, leadership churn from 1998 to the present, resulting in nine ministers with an average tenure of two years, six secretaries with an average tenure of two and a half years, and five chiefs of the Defence Force with an average tenure of four years. The team continued. We note the government has acknowledged the budget uncertainty issue and that it aspires to increase defence spending to 2 per cent of GDP. We also note that the life of this review extends beyond the current economic cycle. It is therefore prudent to assume that defence expenditure may again come under pressure. In any event, the current waste and inefficiency will continue if defence remains in its current form, as it is neither equipped nor organised to make efficient use of whatever funding levels are available to it. Leadership churn and budget uncertainty are the critical root causes of the organisation's complacency. The frequent turnover in ministers and secretaries, in particular, does not enable effective leadership of change. The state of the organisation is symptomatic of one that has not been material or reshaped for over a decade and has been allowed to drift." Unquote. Indeed, since 1996, there have now been 11 defence ministers not to mention numerous assistant ministers and parliamentary secretaries. In the past decade alone, there have been five different governments and seven different ministers. When you consider the consequential shifting composition of the National Security Committee, then this impact of change is compounded. This churn exacerbates the impact of the short three-year political cycle which governments of all hues at the Commonwealth level in Australia face. The reasons for the churn are multiple, but they need to be addressed. Otherwise, long-term commitments will always be in danger of the vagaries of the electoral cycle. In the past three decades, the period 1984 to 1996 was noteworthy, with just two defence ministers in 12 years. Regardless of which party is in government, this level of stability is a critical component of long-term decision-making. It affects not only resourcing, but operational commitments. As you know, the government accepted the first principles review as a roadmap for defence reform for the next five years. Despite defence's outstanding operational record, it was clear that there needed to be a better balance between operational excellence and organisational effectiveness. The first principles review of defence delivered on a coalition election commitment to ensure that defence is appropriately structured and organised and has the right business practices in place to support the ADF in the 21st century. Indeed, these reforms are the biggest since the Howard government's defence efficiency review in 1997 and the Tang reforms of the early 1970s. The review found a proliferation of structures, processes and systems with unclear accountabilities, which in turn caused institutionalised waste, delayed decisions, flawed execution, duplication, over-escalation of issues for decision and low engagement levels amongst the employees in parts of the organisation. At its most basic, the review found that defence must move from the then inefficient federated approach into a single integrated organisation that delivers enhanced joint capability. Implementation of the review formally began on 1 July last year and is now well advanced. For the government to fulfil its commitments, these reforms were necessary to ensure defence was fit for purpose and able to de deliver and implement the defence white paper. But it's also important to demonstrate that any additional public money invested in defence is well spent, especially in a fiscally constrained environment. While the reforms are aimed at ensuring that defence is fit for purpose in the coming years and decades, I believe the process itself was important. The review team led by David Peaver involved a level of external scrutiny and comparison with other organisations and practices that hadn't occurred for decades. It involved, importantly, an alternative source of advice to me as the Minister and to the National Security Committee. Equally important, I believe, was the decision to maintain the review team as an oversight body for the implementation phase. The nature of the Westminster system means that ministers are not experts with years, if not decades, long experience in a particular field, as in the case, for example, of the United States political system. Ministers, like all parliamentarians, are generalists who have to develop quickly a knowledge and an understanding of a new portfolio. Some succeed, others don't. A successful minister needs to understand that he or she does not know what he or she does not know. I don't know what I don't know was my oft-used comment in briefings with Defence. Equally, I would ask 
what haven't I been told? Or what else should I know that I don't? <laughs> it's an interesting question. <laughs> it elicits interesting responses. This is critical, however, where reform is being proposed and implemented if the sole source of advice to the minister is the department. Aversion to change is normal. Protection of vested interests is human. Indeed, in 25 years of public life, I've observed that the greatest force in the political system is inertia. Hence, maintaining the oversight of the first principles review team was to provide a counterbalance of counsel to me as the minister. I could use it to test the advice and response from defence and help to negate the natural aversion to change. This approach is particularly important if there is a change of ministers and help to maintain long-term commitments. There are parallels in this approach with my next issue, the acquisition and sustainment process. <coughs> it's not my intention this morning to address the institutional changes involving the replacement of the DMO with the new capability acquisition and sustainment group. Instead, I wish to ex briefly examine one aspect which relates to the compact with defence and long-term commitments. As the current discussion about submarines illustrates, decisions about the acquisition of military equipment and resources have decades-long impacts. A careful balance between coming to a decision in a timely manner and having sufficient information to make the correct choice must be our aspiration. To delay for years risks future capability and security. To make too hasty a decision risks getting it wrong, long, getting it wrong with long-term, even uh, ex existential consequences. This is why I implemented the competitive evaluation process for submarines and surface ships. A delay of another five to six years for the usual tender process, on top of a previous delay of some five to six years, risks our security in a decade's time. Yet there had to be a process that was competitive, defensible and accurate. Despite the criticism at the time, the competitive evaluation process has demonstrated that major decisions can be made in an informed and timely manner. However, this process does require, I believe, additional safeguards. For this reason, I appointed the expert panel, uh, headed by Professor Don Winter, the former US Secretary of Navy, to ensure that the process met probity requirements. And rather than simply being a watchdog or another regulatory body, the expert panel was able to act as a sounding board for all parties, including the department and the various overseas bidders. Importantly, it provided the minister, the government, and ultimately the citizens with a level of assurance about the process. And it's a process, I believe, that should be utilised in all major defence acquisitions. Moreover, there's a strong case for maintaining the oversight of such a body throughout the acquisition phase as a source of complementary advice and reassurance. I also suggest that there's a stronger role for the parliament in the process. While the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee can examine various defence issues, there's not appear to be the level of scrutiny in Australia that exists, for example, in the US Congress. This could help to overcome the short-term vagaries of the political and electoral cycle. Having the appropriate processes in place can also mitigate the political cycles that democracy entails. For example, the Defence White Paper commenced under my predecessor was all but completed under me and presented by my successor. The First Principles Review was also initiated by my predecessor, agreed to by me and implemented by both myself and Senator Payne. The competitive evaluation process was initiated when I was the minister and the results determined by the current minister. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this paper, I outlined a number of security and defence issues facing Australia. They are ongoing challenges. Any military involvement, as we've seen in Afghanistan and more recently in Iraq, is likely to be prolonged. There is a natural concern in defence that years-long train, advise and assist missions might be the subject to the vagaries of the domestic political cycle. As part of the national compact that I've spoken about, I believe it's incumbent on the government and indeed the parliament of the day to ensure that the ADF has certainty about our national security and defence aspirations and is provided with the necessary long-term commitments where military engagement occurs. As parliamentarians, we owe that certainty to the men and the women who defend this nation. Thank you. We might have a few questions, and because my hand's up first. 
What's the likelihood of parliamentary terms being extended to four or five years? Would that make a difference to the political churn about which you said there were adverse effects for defence? And given that there's a reasonable expectation that incoming governments will have, if it's a change of party, will have two terms, that the minister would be for defence, would be the same minister across those two terms? And would that be something that would alleviate some of the concerns of those who are here today? Uh, Tom, I think it's desirable that we have four-year terms rather than three-year terms, because as you can see, uh, we end up governing for about two and a half years at best on average, which means you're governing for effectively 18 months to two years before you're into the next electoral cycle and all the concentration is on that. Uh, when this was last put to the Australian people, of course, they rejected it, but hopefully at some stage in the future the mood in the country might have changed and if there was another proposal for a constitutional amendment, my my hunch is at the moment that it would get up uh, if it was put again to the Australian people, but you never know. Um, a referenda have a, have a history of failure in Australia, um, but it would be desirable. Y yes, it's been true that generally governments have had two, year, two, two terms in office. Um, I think there's a view in Australia that uh, you give a government a second go. If you don't like what they're doing at the end of the second term, well, then that's the chance to, to toss them out. We've had a period of political uncertainty and turmoil, I suppose. I don't want to overstate it, but we have in Australia in the last few years where we've had this pattern of rotation of leaders and that's not looked upon kindly by the Australian people. Um, they reacted negatively to it when it happened in the Labor Party and we'll wait and see what the reaction is on July 2 um, to what's happened on our side. But overall, regardless of what political party you come from, I think this is an undesirable development so far as the country is concerned. We should have stability at the leadership, uh, equally at the military level as we do at the political level and other levels of civic leadership in the country as well. So a four-year term would help, but if we have this pattern whereby members of a parliamentary party, regardless of which party, uh, when the polls go down, as they always do mid-term, panic and therefore decide to change rather than toughing it out, um, then this is an undesirable situation. Uh, I know John Howard is now associated with ADFA or will be. He said to me a little while ago, well, I wouldn't have lasted more than a term if this was the pattern when I became Prime Minister. And uh, you know, neither would have Bob Hawke and the Keating government as well, and that's undesirable. And having a minister over two terms? Look, having a minister over a period of time uh, is important. Um, when you, as I said, we're all generalists, um, and even if you're a specialist in some area before you come to Parliament, you usually don't end up being a minister in that area. You end up being a minister in a different area. I, a, a little story: when John Howard phoned me to ask me to be the employment minister, um, I spurted out on the phone and regretted soon after saying it. Uh, to him, I said, John, I hope you know I don't know anything about employment and workplace relations. I thought, well, that's a pretty silly thing to say when he's just offered me the job. So um, anyway, we <laughs> kept talking. But that's, that's the nature of it. So the portfolios you come into, you've got to put your head down and try and say as little as you can, get as briefed as much as you can and read as much as you can for the first two or three months to be sufficiently on top of the detail but not bogged down by it, that you can then start to make the kind of strategic, political and other decisions you've got to make um, as a minister. So that takes a period of time. If, if you're then there at the start of a government, I think it's much more important that there is longer term stability because at the start of a new government, there tends to be change. It's when the government's got its ideas, they're all refreshed, you've had a period of time in opposition. You, you tend to know what the changes are you want to make when you come in. If you're coming in towards the end of a government, say you're coming in the third term of government or even in the Howard government the fourth term, um, a lot of the changes are made and you're implementing them at that stage. So I think stability early on in a new government where if there's reforms to be made and changes to be made, you can have certainty at both the level of the department, the, the military leadership and the political leadership, I think that's important for the overall um, stability of the organisation. Uh, and indeed the security of the nation. There's some microphones if you'd, uh, when it comes to you, uh, perhaps your name and your affiliation with what was great. Air Commodore Noel Derwood, Headquarters Joint Operations Command. I appreciate the question about 
political terms and going out to four years. If we look, however, to the Middle East, where the war has been going for decades, um, our current information suggests our fight against Daesh is generational. We're going to be there for a lot more than four years. We need policy that can go span not just one political term or even that second gift cycle. How do we get either the department or our political masters to look that far ahead with strategic policy? Well, that was part of the reason why we planned a defence white paper that stretches out 20 years into the future, because it recognised that these are long-term commitments, um, that things that might happen in the future that we can't necessarily predict at the moment we have to be ready to deal with. And so that was an attempt to look at this in a much longer term. And the hope is, and, and I think it's true, and, and um, Mr Feeney is addressing this conference, but um, despite the day-to-day -day political battles, I think the reality has been largely in Australia an agreement uh, in terms of what our strategic aspirations are. Uh, I would be surprised, for example, if the Labor Party was to win government, that they would make very much of a change so far as the Defence White Paper is concerned, except everything they've said on the public record seems to support that approach, and it makes sense from their perspective to do it um, as well. So what we've got to encourage and uh, is, is this long-term view, and, and that's why I I think I'm the author of it. The, the, the expression compact was used in the UK, but I use it differently to the UK. That was meeting some particular challenges. But as far as I know, I'm the author of that expression in the, in the way in which it's used here in Australia. And I de deliberately chose that as this is about the long term. This is about the, as I said, the balance of the alignment of those three, three things, our aspirations, what we want to do, what our strategic interests are. Uh, then having the armed forces to do it, which means in the third part of it, having the provision of the resources into the future to be able to meet those aspirations. Now, if that idea of a compact is cemented in the psyche of both the political class and reinforced by defence, then I think we've got a chance of having a longer term view um, of these issues. Having an ADF member, ex-ADF member, as defence minister or assistant defence minister, how does that play out, given that you talked about being a generalist? Um, it has pluses and minuses, Tom. Um, you, it, depends on the, it depends on the person concerned. Um, a, a, minister's, a minister's got to take a sort of broader overview of things. As, as I said, it's got to know enough detail to understand what it is, but without getting bogged down in the detail and be able to, in, in uh, uh, coordination with the senior military and indeed civil leadership of defence uh, and with the National Security Committee be able to make those broad strategic decisions um, about what we need to do and the challenges we need to face in the future. So if the former ADF uh, member um, has that ability, then that's a plus. But if the former ADF member um, has operated at a different level where they're more uh, attuned to dealing with the detail, then it's probably a negative. Mm. Other questions, please. Uh, Dr John Blackson, and then across Thank you. Yes, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks for the presentation. Appreciate uh, what your contribution to the nation too. Um, thank you very much for your service. Uh, I just, my question is really about how we place ourselves in the world today. When uh, the war, the so-called war on terror started in 9-11, um, uh, East Asia was a relatively benign place. Uh, the, the Pax Americana was not at all under challenge. We we're all basking in the, in the, in the joys of prosperity and of, uh, 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 of apparent peace in the region. Um, and we committed to wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, confident that our patch was pretty, pretty safe and that we'd invested pretty well in relationships in the region, could, had people who were pretty well plugged in and would, so we could, and, and East Timor kind of demonstrated that in 99. It's 15 years on, the world's a different place, very dark place. Uh, we're facing some Hobbesian looking challenges in our patch that make the kind of challenges that are ongoing and seemingly unchanging in the me Middle East look relatively uh, inconsequential for us, 
I'm wondering if, in light of the changing dynamics, you now think you now view the situation, our commitment in the Middle East, in a different light. Should we do more? Should we do less? What can we do to reinvest in our neighbourhood, given the fact that we've got people who, you know, language skills have atrophied, relationships have atrophied, uh, we have a generation of senior officers whose experience is only in the Middle East, not in Southeast Asia or the Pacific. Where should we go with that? Well, if you've got about an hour, I could answer that, uh, but let me try and do so briefly. Um, I think the commitment in the Middle East was important and significant. Um, are we doing enough? I'm on the public record as saying I believe we should be doing more. Uh, the advise and assist mission, the building uh, partner capacity missions, I think have been important and significant, but um, haven't been, uh, at least up until recently, sufficient to displace ISIS or Daesh. And uh, my view was that we needed um, incisive, specialised missions that would go in and take out the Daesh leadership in particular, not full-scale invasion of Iraq or, or indeed Syria, but more. And indeed, that's what uh, Secretary Carter announced uh, in the US, I think, in December of last year. And there is evidence that that's the approach now being adopted that wasn't uh, in the past. And personally, I thought we should have adopted that approach earlier uh, than we did. But, but you're right. Um, our interest uh, in the future is in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and if you look at the white paper, it basically takes a regional plus approach, the region being the Indo, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, the biggest challenge, in my view, um, is probably not the uh, threat of Islamist terrorism in uh, Southeast Asia. That is a challenge, and it's a very big concern to all governments and all defence ministers I spoke to uh, in the region all shared the same concerns about that. But I think the biggest challenge in our region is the management of China. Uh, China is increasingly assertive, as you know. Uh, President Xi Jinping stood uh, at a podium at the White House next to President Obama and said, we will not militarise um, the artificial reefs in the South China Sea. Uh, as I said afterwards, I presume he meant we won't further militarise them, because we knew they'd already militarised some of them. Uh, but now we learn that they've gone further. They've got uh, military aircraft using the runway uh, of uh, one of those islands. We know that um, uh, they've, they've had armed Coast Guard vessels, which is an escalation in the East China Sea. Um, so there's a very assertive approach that China under Xi Jinping um, is taking to you know, their claim to the territory in the so-called Nine Dash Line. And how, how we manage um, China uh, over the coming years and decades, I think, is going to have a very significant influence in terms of our region. Uh, and this is at a time when, if you look at China, I think it's fair to say that internally it's become more repressive. Um, there is a reversion to the sort of Mao syndrome that Xi Jinping seems to be the new Mao Zedong in terms of the, the central power being exercised by one person. He's recently uh, named himself or had himself named as commander in chief of the forces in addition to other uh, other uh, uh, titles that he carries. There's photos that weren't featured in the Australian media, were featured prominently in the Asian media of Xi Jinping in, in, in uh, battle camouflage uniform touring the joint operations facility uh, outside Beijing. These are all signs, if you like, of, of what I call a, a very assertive approach being taken by China. And that is something that we're going to have to manage. Now, um, the American pivot uh, to the region is important. And who knows what's going to happen after the American presidential election and who's going to be the occupant of the White House uh, after that. But let's hope that, in my view, the Americans don't become isolationist um, in the next uh, administration, because that will have consequences for us and for the region um, as well. In addition to that, you've got a much more assertive President Putin uh, and whilst we're a fair way away from that, nonetheless, uh, you know, Vladis Vostok uh, is in our region, so Russia has uh, designs not just uh, in, in the uh, European part of the world, but in other parts of the world as well. One, one good thing, I think, out of China's assertiveness is that it's probably, to some extent, driven other nations in China to uh, a, a more shared view of the world uh, than perhaps they had. I mean, take Vietnam, for example, which has been reaching out to America and to us 
uh, in defence and military terms for greater cooperation, something that may not have happened if China had not been so assertive in the past. But we frankly, it, it, it's, it, it would be over sanguine to see the future as anything but very challenging. So an implosion of Papua New Guinea or another Pacific <laughs> island or a coup in a, in a small country that causes us concern and, or which we may want to rebuild uh, yeah. or help to rebuild? Well, when I, when I spoke about a failed nation state, I deliberately chose not to mention the one that most comes to mind, and you can guess that for yourself. Um, but if that was to occur, uh, that would be a very big challenge for this country because the country I'm thinking of has got the fastest growing population in the region. Health standards are going backwards. Its system of government um, leaves a lot to be desired. And if there was a collapse of that nation, then we would have a major challenge on our hands for years, if not decades, into the future. With consequences for what we're now doing in the Middle East? Well, have consequences for our resourcing of what, what we're doing, because if, if we had to engage uh, much more, I mean, you think about the engagement uh, in Timor, in the Solomons, uh, the level of commitment that that required, if there was another nation state that was to fail, which required a much higher level of commitment than each of those engagements, you can see that would be a very considerable drain on our resources in Australia, and then that would have, that would have an impact uh, in terms of what else we're able to do. Now, I'm not predicting that that will occur, but you cannot remove it as a risk. Uh, it may be a small risk, but it's a risk if it was to eventuate, eventuate the consequences would be grave. Thanks, mate. Good morning, sir. Uh, Jeff Cooper from the Centre for Army Lessons. Uh, thanks for making the response to the last question a good segue into mine. I just wanted to know if you had any observations that you would make at the portfolio level about how the defence mission for capacity building um, matches or at least supports the greater uh, government capacity building in these nations that we're supporting. Um, does that make sense? Uh, y yes, it does. I mean, we traditionally see defence as in the pure militaristic uh, defensive or offensive role. Uh, whereas if you look at what we've been trying to do, for example, in Afghanistan and Iraq, it's more about ultimately about building a peaceful future uh, in those countries, what we did in Timor. Uh, yes, we, the initial mission was there, was to deal with the situation that, that arose, but over time it became something about a peacekeeping and peace building exercise as well. And ultimately that's what we need to be on about. I mean, uh, as I think uh, Tom or uh, Professor Freyder said in his introduction, uh, it's, it's through the study of conflict uh, that we may learn lessons for how about how we can achieve a more peaceful future. And that's what, from a, uh, a parliamentary or a governmental uh, leadership position, we're most interested in. No, nobody, I think, wants war or military conflict for the sake of military conflict. Um, what, why do we engage in military conflict? You engage to either win the conflict or to um, prolong the conflict to such a period of time where you can negotiate for peace. Uh, at the end of it. Now, that's a bit simplistic, I understand that, but that's ultimately what, in a sense, we've been trying to do in Afghanistan and, and probably less so in Iraq, given I don't think the caliphate is interested in a negotiated peace. And in terms of the impediments of the whole government approach? Well, increasingly, government has to be joined up. I mean, when we talk about national security, we're talking about a whole range of portfolios and departments and approaches. and. Um, and that's reflected, I think, in the, the fact that these issues are dealt with in the National Security Committee, in which you have the Treasury, you have the Finance Minister, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister. So you're trying to bring not just the defence portfolio perspective to it, but bringing a broader perspective in terms of the decision making that occurs. Thank you. Perhaps. things you ever wanted to ask a former Defence Minister, here's a chance. <laughs> uh, David Matthews from DSC Group. Um, having just gone through the first principles review, we've got some expertise in reform. So is there a role for um, in Indigenous capacity building missions, not just training infantry tactics, but um, teaching other countries reform of their Department of Defence? Oh, very much so. Uh, um, 
the relationships that we build between defence in Australia, both at the military and the civil side, with defence departments and defence forces overseas are, in my view, critical. The more that we can do um, to build rapport, um, e even with nations that we may have some challenges with. I mean, for example, I think we should be trying to build as much rapport with the Chinese military establishment uh, as we do with the Japanese or the Indonesians or any other, because if there is a level of rapport, uh, personal knowledge of key people and understanding, that's already created a dialogue which can be important in terms of dealing with challenges that might arise in the future. So I see that as a very significant part of the role of defence in Australia, N not just in the narrow, instrumental, practical terms of can we help them to have a better defence department or can we help them to be more efficient in the acquisition of resources, et cetera, et cetera, but I think at the broader diplomatic level that that dialogue and rapport is an important component of the national mission that we have, and that is to have a peaceful region and, if possible, a peaceful world. And what is the role of the crossbench in terms of contributing either to defence policy? I noted last night that Chris Hillman, my friend, tried to get an answer out of Senator Di Natale on the matter of was defence spending too much <coughs> or too little, and he was obviously wanting to direct attention to his foremost concerns. Do they, have they, should they, can they contribute to um, shaping up defence policy or are their interests too sectional or that's too partial for that to happen? It, it depends on the composition of the crossbench from time to time. I mean, we, we've got a crossbench now which is, um, it's been very difficult to manage politically because there is not one interest. Historically in Australia, a third party has had the balance of power in the Senate. If you go back uh, to after the Labor split in the mid-50s, the Democratic Labor Party had the balance of power for a long period of time. The Australian Democrats then had the balance of power for a long period of time. Uh, the Greens more recently have had the balance of power and now you've got this because of the way in which the electoral system has been able to be manipulated or used. You've got this um, um, bunch of different interests who make up crossbench. Now, the electoral reforms will probably change that, but um, according to all the commentators, to which I subscribe, um, the government is unlikely to have a majority in the Senate uh, after July 2. Uh, so there will still be a, a, a Labor Party and then a minority party or parties. It's, it's likely to be a combination of the Greens and Senator Xenophon if he gets one or two more uh, senators elected. Uh, maybe one or two of the existing uh, independent crossbenchers might uh, might survive. So it's not going to be one um, one political grouping. It's probably going to be at least two, if not a three, political groupings, and that makes it very difficult because when you're trying to negotiate with um, a variety of different political forces that each come from a different perspective, it becomes almost impossible. Which has been the been the story of the last few years so far as Australia is concerned. That, that's not a good thing in terms of stability, um, but we'll just have to see uh, what the composition of the Senate is after the election. Well, you need to go back to that place of fun. So <laughs> would you please join me in thanking Mr Andrews again.